Thank you very much. Uh, just to say a special word of thanks to GBIF for providing the opportunity to talk about some of the work we're doing in Ireland. Um, I'm going to give us a brief presentation about some of the work of the, the national data management services that we provide in Ireland. Um, the Irish national node, GBIF node, was set up by the equivalent of our environment ministry. And the starting point for our centre is the mobilisation of data. Our ministry wants us to make sure that the data is used for policy implementation and for conservation management. So that's very much the, the starting point for us. For those of you who don't know where, where Ireland is, we're the little island in the Atlantic. We're just beside the soon-to-be independent Republic of Scotland. <laughs> and the perhaps not so United Kingdom. <laughs> Couldn't resist that. Oops. One of the things about Ireland, it's an island nation, and the land mass of Ireland forms just one-tenth of the territorial area of the country. So we have a brief for mapping in the terrestrial and the marine environment. The areas in, in, in dark blue are the sites, the parts of the country that have formal, strict nature conservation designation. About 16% of the terrestrial area of Ireland is designated for strict nature conservation um, uh, priorities. These are, area, these are highlighted in dark blue. I'm just going to give two or three different examples of the applications that our mapping system, data management services, provide in terms of policy implementation. The first thing I'm going to focus on is perhaps the, tradi the, the traditional informing species conservation. The data centre, the Irish Node, has developed its own biodiversity maps. It's a mapping system and data portal. This is what the front end looks like. I just want to draw your attention to the panel on the bottom right hand side to show the statistics for the, the database. We have mobilized just in excess of 3 million species observations. We have data on f over 14,000 species, which is one third of all the species that occurs within Ireland. And we've mobilized a just over 100 data sets. But of course, from a policy relevant point of view, Policy makers, decision makers aren't really interested in many of the 14,000 species. What they're interested in are the ones that are particularly of policy relevance. So we have tagged the species that are relevant to them by different types of relevance. One is groups that are considered invasive species. The others are the protected species. And the third category then are those that are threatened with extinction. Choosing one, for, just to work through an example, if you choose the protected species category, it lists the four pieces of legislation that protects wildlife in Ireland. Two European, uh, European pieces of legislation, our own National Wildlife Act and a flora protection order. The system then lists each of the species protected under those relevant pieces of legislation. And choosing one of these comes up with a species profile. This provides information, a map showing where it occurs within Ireland whether it's on the marine or the terrestrial side. It provides a lot of information on the taxonomy, the synonymy, and some of the relevant information about the occurrences within the data set. And then on the bot bottom, there's two panels showing the distribution of records each month across the data set and a temporal spread to just give you a flavor of some of the, uh, some of the issues around the species profile. These records, species observations can be plotted and mapped on a dynamic map at various scales. This is showing you the scale, uh, the All-Ireland scale. If you're interested, you can zoom right down to the 1 to 50,000 scale, which plots the observations that occur. And you can even go down at the aerial photograph level. This gives you a lot more fine level information about where these species have been recorded. But one of the important things from a policy perspective, species observations in their own are of limited value. So we have brought on board a lot of habitat data as GIS layers into this system. Just want to give you a flavor of the types of information that are available. Sorry, I should say I'm just running ahead of myself. Each of the individual points can be queried to give you information. Donald showed you this kind of information in his presentation. The, the date of the occurrence, uh, this, where it's been recorded, the recorder name, 
and what data set, etc., it comes from. So this is important information to know if it's, in, if it's an old record or a contemporary record. But we have mobilized a lot of habitat layers into the GIS system, so these can be switched on and off as your query depends. So if you're interested in habitats that are protected by European law, for example, you can switch on one of these layers. If I'm interested to know if, if the site has an environmental designation or not, you can activate that layer. So you get, it's, it's a standard GIS package where you can add up the queries and build the information base as you go along. The key thing is once these layers are activated and then you perform that initial query again, you get the record information as we showed earlier on, but it gives you additional associated information, for example, that the species was recorded within fixed dunes, which is a, which is a, a, a habitat protected under the European legislation, and it occurs within a special area of designation site. So this information straight away is actually very useful to policymakers who can, who can see that, for example, if this species was recorded, it's recorded in an area that's already protected by European law. That was perhaps the, the, the traditional approach, but in, we're also interested in informing spatial planning processes. And this is very, very important in Ireland, where we're interested in trying to be at the coal phase of conservation. So our information, we hope, will get feed right into the planning process very early on. The key to this is to, to be able to perform spatial queries, to be able to get data about the biodiversity value of different units of land within the, la within the island of Ireland. Again, it will very much depend on what your specific question you have to ask, but i just give you an example here. This is showing the, the various uh, sites that are designated under European legislation, the special areas of conservation. If you hover over the area that you're, or the site that you're interested in, it highlights an area, and you just click that, and it generates a report. The report provides information on what species have been recorded within that designated site or within that site of interest. So this is the type of report that's generated, an Excel spreadsheet. The covering sheet shows a map of the area you've chosen, and the information then is presented in a tabular format. So this list, in this case, there was somewhere in the region of 800 species have been recorded within this designated site, and it lists the information in this format. The species group, the, 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 the species name, the common name, the number of records, the number of times that the species was observed within that site, the date of the last record, which is very important, so you know whether it's contemporary record or not, and the title of the data set from which the record comes. This is very important because what we have metadata associated then with each, of the, with each of the data sets, so you can go very quickly to the metadata and assess its fitness for use for the particular purpose that you're looking for. And what's important then is the designations that we've tagged to the organisms. So if you're interested in, for example, just invasive species, you'll get a queue, you'll get a list of all the species which are designated as inv invasive species within that site. But perhaps more importantly, it identifies the species that are afforded protection under European law. So this is essentially a kind of a shop window of the information that exists within our data set for different given areas. And it means that very early on in the statutory planning processes that this data is available to planners for decision makers. And it's cues that they have to say, well, development, if it's to go on, has to take mitigation measures for these species, or perhaps that if there's a, a threatened species, part of, the, or part of the, the, the planning process would require an up-to-date survey of the distribution of, this, 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 uh, of these organisms. The key thing is to get into the process early on. And pragmatically, the issue is, although our, our mapping system is state-of-the-art and we, we're quite pleased with the development work, there's always the case that other local authorities, other, other bodies have their own GIS systems, which very often are not entirely compatible with, with, with the one we have. So we've cre created a facility where users can download shapefiles from their own systems onto their desktop and can query our database using their own shapefiles. And this is, this is a very pragmatic step, but it does mean straight away that there's a kind of a fit between different GIS systems and the data can be, can be mined very easily from our system. And this, they can store the information on their, on their laptop, which our database, uh, on um, PC. There are two examples in terms of a species query 
and an area query which, which allows people to interrogate the database. One of the other things that we've, we've provided is for, we're a national organization and we, we provide an online data management service for data providers. We're a small island, so there isn't a lot of competing interests. So we've provided a facility online where, where recorders can capture their data, digitize their data through our system, and store their data and map their data. This is just gives you a, an overview or a screen grab, really, of the, the kind of data entry template that we have. And the key thing is to show that there's different ways to import your data. Um, this is what the form looks like. This is one just for recording mammals. But we have the ability to, to customize data entry forms for any national expert, for any NGO or uh, organ professional organization. We can customize these data using our own database. And these forms can be embedded on the partner organization's websites without any branding from the data center. So it looks as if the partner organizations have their own data management system. What it allows them to do, and we find this is, serves most data pr uh, providers, it allows them to query their own data by taxonomic group, what observations have been done by taxonomic group. It allows them to, to query their data spatially. And we've developed a small little Google Maps application which allows the organizations or the individuals to actually map their own data and query the individual records. It's a kind of a, a mapping system light. But for most organizations, this is all they need to do, and they're very, they're very happy with that, with that system. But the benefit is that any observations are, that are out there who want to work with us, they can digitize their data through this, and the data is made available both to the partner organization and to the data center uh, very, very efficiently. So this is just a simplified schematic model of how the, the system works. On the left-hand side, we have our National Biodiversity Database. This is where all the validated data resides. It's from this high-quality validated data that the Biodiversity Maps data feeds into. And then through the internet, all that data can be acquired, can be accessed by the data user. There, the data user is only accessing validated, scientifically um, accurate data. And then through the development of Web Service API, we provide data to GBIF. We provide it to third-party organizations, partner organizations, and we have developed a mobile phone app. So this is a whole series of uh, services we're providing to our partner organizations. And the provision of the recording form, the record submission form then, allows us to obtain uh, capture data, and we, we put that into a recording system database. This is what the recorders can use for their own data management system, and it, it, it allows us to capture a lot of data. We can extract the data from that recorder system database and from data providers. And there's a v data validation and verification system before the data then resides into the National Biodiversity Database. So the point here is that there's two parallel systems. The one to the left of that hatch line is with validated data. If we want to providing data to, to the science policy interface or from the, let's say, strategic planning side, we have to make sure that that data is high quality. So we have to make sure that any of the data we mobilize is as high quality and as, as validated as we can make it. And the system, the, the, the data management system that we provide then to our partners and providers is right of the line, and we're not actually, we're not saying that those data are validated, but people can use them. And the important thing is that there is a firewall between the two data sets, and we try to ensure there's very little contamination that way. Of course, this is very important for us because it means that there's a direct link between the data providers and feeding in to the policy and conservation measures that we're involved in. And I just want to give you one or two examples of how this might work in reality. Any individual, citizen scientists or organization, once they start accumulating the data, those data, once they're validated, are now available for setting conservation priorities. In Ireland, that's done through the production of red lists. And most of you are familiar with the red list process. This is just an example of, um, of how the red lists work. You, get, you have a database for a particular species, 
and you compare the distribution over time between one time period and another and based on internationally accepted criteria by the IUCN you can say whether the species is declining uh, or not or, and then you can assign it a threat category if that's safe. So this is the kind of information. Directly citizen scientists can feed into this process. And we have an active uh, red list program in Ireland. This shows you the taxonomic groups that have been red listed. It shows you the percentage of the various threat categories. As a kind of a general rule of thumb, one third of all species that occur in Ireland are threatened with extinction. It's not particularly nice to have to say, but uh, it's like everywhere else. And, it, and Tim mentioned then that the, this, for example, is one of the indicators that we use in our national biodiversity uh, targets, and it's one of the Aichi, Aichi targets. So this information, not only is it mobilized in terms of trying to assess conservation priorities, it is actually also feeds into the setting of conservation uh, priorities and targets within Ireland. Of course, once you have the data mobilized, once the data is digitized and we can avail of it, and it's, we start working the data for conservation, the possibilities are actually quite endless. And this is where the exciting bit occurs, is where you can actually start asking questions of the data set. And I just want to give you two brief examples of the type of thing that we can do. You don't have to be able to read the, the species name. That's, that's not really important. But what we've done is that we have taken all the non-marine mollusks, the threatened non-marine mollusks that occur in Ireland that have been formally, that have gone through the formal conservation uh, assessment, the red list process. And the ones that are red are critically endangered, the ones that are orange are endangered, and the ones that are green are vulnerable. We asked the simple question of the database. We said, if, if it was appropriate way to get conservation um, measures implemented through our protected area network, what percentage of the threatened non-marine mollusks would occur within protected areas in Ireland? So we did that exercise and we found, for example, with the critically endangered species that it ranged from between 30% of the population of some of the species to 100% occurred within the protected area network. So this is very useful for conservation management purposes. If, for example, the majority of these species occurred within protected areas, perhaps the way to deliver conservation management, conservation actions for this suite of species might be through the, the protected area network. I think this exercise showed us that the protected area network is only, uh, is only partially useful as, as a measure for actually delivering conservation action for threatened non-marine mollusks. But it gives you an idea of the types of questions that you can start asking of the data set that are hugely relevant then to our decision makers. And the final example I just want to show you then are the types of applications that we've, we've worked on. We've taken all the threatened freshwater species that occur within, our, within Ireland. We mobilized the data and we did a kind of a hotspot, a biodiversity hotspot analysis of where they occur. And when we did this, we found that we can present to the government about a dozen key sites within Ireland that contain the majority of threatened freshwater species. So that if you're serious, and of course that's a big question, if the government is serious about conserving threatened freshwater species, uh, we can say to them, all you have to do is conserve and have proper conservation measures within these dozen hotspots for freshwater species. And the other thing that I notice in terms of decision makers and, and policy makers is that they, they absolutely love maps. So. This is uh, producing kind of synthesis and overview maps of this type is the one thing that does actually get them to sit up and take notice. Um, and we find that condensing a lot of data down into simple kind of maps like this tends to, to work very effectively. So that's all I want to say. Thank you very much, Tim. Do you want me to say Donald Hoban, um, GVIF Secretariat. Um, Liam, I, I was really interested in the firewalled separation that you were showing uh, with the data validation. Could you just say a little bit more first about, is that a validation all involving expert review or is it entirely automated or a mixture? And secondly, 
For the right-hand side, do they get any visibility as to which records have gone through the validation and been approved? The, the validation is a combination of automated processes, but we do have, for each, for each taxonomic group, we have a national expert or experts that, do, that tends to validate the data, so it's a combination of both. Um, we, the second question was, do they get feedback really on what species have not been validated, or have not been accepted? What, what I meant is that by the time the data reaches GBIF, is there, is there the possibility of there being a column in the data that says these ones were validated as part of the network and were considered to be scientifically good quality? Yeah, actually, none of the data, uh, unvalidated data, comes to GBIF. The firewall, yeah, so we, 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 we try to make sure that, uh, that uh, it's, it's assessed before it comes into our database. Yeah. Yes, a question here. Thank you. Patricia Cole from Mexico. Um, thank you very much, Liam. It's very interesting. Uh, but the evaluation of um, species in the red list requires a lot of information about abundances. It is not so easy. I mean, the, the maps are a good start for knowing the, the extent of the distribution. But you have been doing some adjustments to the database to keep all this information and times are, or monitoring. I would be interested in that. Yeah, you're right. This is just occurrence data showing where species occur. We, we run a series of monitoring programs which are separate, uh, which provide, uh, which track um, uh, relative abundance over time. But uh, again, for the red list, for the red list process, as you mentioned, we're able to, in terms of the interpretation of the maps, we draw on other additional sources of information as well. But the... Um, yeah, we have different tools to use uh, population densities to f give further, further um, uh, detail to the distributions that, that are mapped, if that answers your question. Do you have this information about population densities within the database or it's not linked? No, it's not within it. It's purely just a mapping exercise. We have, to, we have other tools that we, we extract that information from. Okay, just one more quick question and then, then we should move on. Uh, thanks. Christoph Heuser, Natural History Museum, Berlin, Germany. Uh, following from Donald questions on the non-automated uh, data quality, um, to what extent have you invested there? Are you planning to expand? I think that also goes back to Donald's presentation. I believe we need all of us to look into this, to engage communities and to also move forward with, with data quality. So I'd be interested, and maybe we can take that offline, but have you, you, you briefly mentioned you have experts. Is, is there anything more? It's one of the beauties about living in a small country is that we, we know people, and it's, it's actually quite a subjective process. Yeah, but it, it, for us, it works for the moment. <laughs>